the beta Weizsäcker formula. This is a video primarily aimed at students as we are already very deep into nuclear chemistry here. So the formula is something you've probably seen and discussed in lectures before, but have we ever done calculations with it? We didn't. Quick overview. The beta Weizsäcker formula is a semi-empirical formula, meaning it cannot predict anything, but it can explain the observations made in 1935 quite well. It utilizes the liquid drop model of the nucleus. Now there are two major theories attempting to explain the stability of atomic nuclei, the liquid drop model and the nuclear shell model. There are many special versions of both, but what can the liquid drop model do? It was used to explain nuclear fission and the associated release of energy. It's very good at explaining the binding energies of nucleons. We will calculate that shortly. What it cannot do is explain magic numbers. Enough overview, I won't be able to derive the formula mathematically as it is, but I will show you what lies behind each term and what should go on mentally inside of your head. This is the entire equation with which you can calculate the total binding energy of the nucleus and this is always the classical image that goes along with it. It's a great image to be honest. So first of all we see a V, a S, a C, a A and a delta. The formula is divided into five terms and for each term you need a constant that has been experimentally determined. This is is what they look like in the third edition of Karl Heinrich Lisa. There are still some outdated values. Well, the book is from 1991. Hmm? There is a different notation for the fourth term, but we will get to that in a moment. First and foremost, A is the number of nucleons, Z is the proton number, N is the neutron number. Let's do this with the example of iron 56. First, let's start with the volume term. Like in a drop, a water droplet, we have a lot of water molecules held together by hydrogen bonds. The more water molecules around, the better. Right in the middle of the droplet, there are molecules with the maximum number of water molecules bound to it and thus they have the highest binding energy. Exactly the same in the nucleus. Let's imagine we have a certain number of as yet unidentified nuclear particles, so all of them are the same. No protons, no neutrons, just nuclear particles for now. They are attracted to each other by the strong force. Our constant 15.56 mega electron volts times our 56 nuclear particles, which form our droplet, this brings us to 871.38 mega electron volts total binding energy. But in most literature the binding energy is plotted per nucleon, so accordingly we divide by 56, well we get 15.56 mega electron volts per nucleon. What we have just done is calculate the theoretically highest possible binding energy per nucleon. But what we've completely left out is, for example, that the droplet has an end at some point with 56 nuclear particles, there must be a surface where nucleons have fewer neighbors and therefore are less attracted. We need to factor that in, for that there is this surface term. It looks like this. For our iron 56, let's plug it in, taking our constant of 17.23 mega electron volts, aha, now we are down to 11 mega electron volts per nucleon. And this graphic here is a very good support when doing these calculations. Okay, now let's factor in that we do not have a uniform mixture of just nuclear particles because some of these unidentified nuclear particles are protons which have a repulsive positive charge. The constant use for this Coulomb term has the value of 0.7 mega electron volts. The fact that we have 26 of these repulsive protons should be taken into account. Now we are down to 8.84 mega electron volts per nucleon. Afterwards I always divide the value in the calculator by the number of nucleons in this case it's 56. In this symmetry term we now take into account the other previously mentally unidentified particles as neutrons. In iron 56 we have a neutron surplus which strictly speaking has a destabilizing effect as neutrons are not as stable as protons. More unstable particles means less binding energy per nucleon. The constant here has the value of 23.285 mega electron volts. Here we only come down to 8.7 to 8 mega electron volts per nucleon with a small correction. Of course, the heavier the nucleus, the higher the neutron surplus, the more important this term becomes. And iron 56 is a GG nucleus, an even number of protons, 26, and with 30 neutrons we also have an even number of neutrons. GG nuclei 
are stable and that makes the nucleus a bit more stable again. And in this case, we are allowed to add plus 11 times 56 to the power of minus one half, which brings the binding energy to 8.755 mega electron volts per nucleon. If it was a UG nucleus, this term should be neglected. If it was to be a UU nucleus, you would calculate minus 11 times a to the power of minus one half. How do we know that we have calculated correctly? Well, the image is already a good orientation aid, but of course we want to see the literature. And I will take the values from the isotope browser and we are really close to that. I hope I gave you a good insight into this equation and it doesn't look as overwhelming as it did at the beginning of the video. With this you can already approach the binding energy of even unstable nucleides quite well. If you want to practice doing these calculations I would recommend taking heavier nucleides than calcium and preferably not double magic nucleides. Otherwise you will deviate a bit too much from the literature values. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Eric Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, goodbye.